In July, Council directed staff to contact a donation um, from the Stanford Institute of Economic Policy Research. Professor Nation has worked very quickly in the last couple months to pull together a draft report that he'll be presenting to you tonight. And he's going to be addressing uh, an alternative perspective uh, on how um, liabilities and assets should be valued. He's got some comparisons to some of our neighboring cities, Anaheim, Costa Mesa, and Newport Beach. And he has identified a number of um, measures that could be considered by council for approaching these unfunded liabilities. And I think we have we have a draft report tonight. We don't have anything final to present to you. Mr. Nation is going to take your feedback and input back, and he's going to finalize the report. And one of the next options uh, that we have available is inviting uh, Professor Nation back mm -hmm. to do another report in um, at council chambers, where he'll present his final and be available for additional discussion. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Nation. Great, thank you very much. Uh, is this mic in the right place? Can you guys hear me? Well yeah. enough? Great, thank you. Um, uh, Madam Mayor and Council Members, thanks for the chance to, to be here. Um, I first want to say for the record that this is the state, same Stanford University that beat USC on Saturday, <laughs> 21 to 14, in case anyone missed that. Uh, <laughs> At any rate, uh, I'm very proud of the football team there and a lot of other things that we do. I, I also want to introduce myself and give you a little bit of background on, on my perspective on this. Um, some people sometimes say, well, you know, you, you spend too much of your time beating up pension systems and CalPERS, and, and uh, there is a perception by some folks that this is anti public employee. Let me tell you from my perspective, I come from a family of five. I'm the only one who either is not or has not been in public service. That my younger brother's a firefighter paramedic, still is. My mom is a high school librarian. My dad works at university. My older brother is a former high school uh, math and science teacher. So I understand how important public service is and, and appreciate the work that folks do there. I do think that the pension system is in very serious trouble, uh, particularly in, in California. There are other states that are in worse shape, but things are extraordinarily bad, I think, in, it is a manageable problem, but I think that cities like Fullerton will have to pull out every possible option to get back on the right track. Everything that is, you know, that might be considered probably has to be done in the long run. Uh, so we'll talk about uh, these uh, unfunded pension, public pension and retiree health care liabilities in those four cities. Um, here's the background. At the top of this, you see pension background, benefit levels, and so forth. Those are the different sections of the briefing, so you'll be able to see that those are in bold italics, so we'll know exactly where we are in the presentation. Sponsored by the city, those are the objectives, pretty straightforward. I want to compare public and private. I want to look at benefit levels across the, um, the cities here. Estimate the funding status on funding line. It's a little bit like what uh, Carrie just did here. Estimate future contribution rates uh, under different assumptions assess the impact of those on the city's budgets and the city's expenditures, and then uh, deliverables or a report, uh, as Gretchen mentioned, and also this presentation. Uh, public sector is mostly defined benefit plans in contrast to the private sector, which for well, those who have them are still, for, for the most part, defined contribution plans. Um, and so a defined benefit plan essentially means that you are effectively guaranteed a certain amount of income or a certain level when you after X years of service based on a benefit formula. Um, most people believe those to be ironclad. Uh, the guy who runs Seaver, where I'm housed, calls them hell or high water obligations. He says, if you gotta pay it, then you gotta pay it. There's, you, know, you can't find some way to get out. There's some legal discussion about whether they're ironclad, but most people think they are. The public sector has a different set of rules than the private sector. And those different sets of rules have a really significant impact, I think a detrimental impact on the system overall. Those rules typically push costs to the future. It's sort of, uh, you know, for those of you who watched Popeye growing up, when he said, I'm glad we pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. It was about pushing those costs in the future. And with most public pension system funds, they push them way into the future. Uh, and which means you, in the end, pay more for that. That, that so here are some of the things that are different between 
CalPERS and private sector defined benefit plans, or the few defined benefit plans that are out there in the private sector. Uh, the discount rate, the discount rate is the rate at which you discount your future liabilities. You're essentially saying I'm going to discount that hundred million dollars total that I owe to my workers, retired workers. CalPERS discounts that at seven and a half percent. In the private sector, they discounted about four or five percent. I have an example of exactly what the impact of that is. I'll show you. But it's a huge, has a huge impact on the on the overall financial status of the funds. Investment rate of return in percent. Calpers, uh, as you heard, uses seven and a half percent. In the private sector, it varies. Some are five, some are eight, uh, but they don't set their contribution rates based on that. Amortization period, if you have a loss, as CalPERS and others have had, how long do you have to essentially pay that off? With CalPERS and most others, they've paid off over 30 years. So instead of fixing it pretty quickly, seven years, as you know, the private sector, they're able to do that over a much longer period of time. Asset smoothing, and Harry mentioned that briefly as well, CalPERS will smooth their assets over 15 years. And there's an argument to smooth assets because you have these wild fluctuations in the market. 15 years, in my opinion, is probably too long. In the private sector, for the most part, it's a two-year smoothing period. So the effect of all of those, these four key things, are to push those costs in the future. And that's why you're looking at that steep hill that you just heard um, in terms of contributions over the next few years. Here's an example of how a discount rate determines funding status. In the middle column, I have what we call a high discount rate. Uh, this is the actual one that CalPERS uses, 7.5%. On the right column, a low discount rate of 5%. Simple example, let's assume you have $300 million in assets. Same in both situations. In liabilities, if you discount at 7.5%, you say, well, our liabilities are only 203 because you're discounting at a higher rate. You're essentially saying, I owe less in the future in today's dollars or in present value terms. <laughs> If you use the 5%, the number is 412. And so with the high discount rate, 7.5%, you conclude, you say, well, we're not even underfunded. We've got seven, $17 million surplus, so our ratio, our funding ratio, assets to liabilities is 106%. If you discount at 5%, you actually have a $112 million run fund liability and a 73% funded ratio. Um, so very different conclusions based on what sort of assumptions you use as you uh, work through these two different uh, approaches. There's a lot of debate over what the right discount rate or investment rate of return should be. With CalPERS, the investment rate is rate of return is the same as the discount rate. And if you look back over a really long period of time, as in 30 years from 1982 to 2012, CalPERS has earned on a geometric basis or a compounded basis more than 9% per year. I mean, studying numbers when you think about that. The reason for that is because we had this huge run up in the stock market from 1982 to 1999. If you take a different perspective, you say, well, let's, let's, let's see what's happened between 1999 and 2012, then it's about 4.5%. Then uh, I put in the last. Uh, four or five years, 2007, and also the last year, about 1%. So people say, well, if you really look over this long period of time, we, we, we can justify 7.5%. Other people say, the world's different now, you ought to use 4 or 5%. And if you look at some other research that's been done out there, especially on things that I do a little bit of work on called equity premium, or equity premium, where you say, well, how much more do you get if you invest in equities versus treasuries and more secure investments? If you believe the research that's out there today, you really should use it about 5%. That's the right number, not 7.5%. And that makes a huge difference in your funding status as well. Those different perspectives result in different investment rates uh, of return and probabilities of, of, of achieving those. There are a lot of numbers on this chart. I apologize for that. Now let's focus on a couple of numbers. So the, um, the investment rate of return is shown on the left. And then those two other columns show the probability of meeting or exceeding that rate based on historical experience. So if you look at what CalPERS did over the 1982 to 2012 period, and you say, well, let's assume that's the future we're looking at, 
the odds of hitting, I guess I'll highlight here, 7.5% is 75%. So you say, well, that's a reasonable number to use. We have a three, in, three out of four chance of actually achieving the target that we have if we have 30 years looking forward that are like the last 30 years. On the other hand, if you say, well, I really think that the next 30 years are probably going to be more like the last 10 or 12 or 13 years, we only have a one in five chance, a 22% chance of meeting that objective. So it's all about that perspective that, that you have. I will tell you that Warren Buffett, who has done relatively well with investments, um, says that the number that CalPERS and others should use is six or six and a half percent. Uh, folks at Stanford think, I mean, I, that's the number I think is reasonable. People at Stanford think that ought to be closer to five. Most of the people at Stanford do. So, but whether it's five or six, uh, it, you know, it doesn't make a huge difference, uh, but it definitely you know, makes a huge difference, certainly that first step when you go from seven and a half to six, or certainly from seven and a half to five. Benefit levels, I'll just have one slide, and it's relatively similar. Um, they're slightly lower in Fullerton, that may be made up for by slightly higher salaries, I don't know. Uh, but miscellaneous is 255. It excludes Social Security, that's not the norm right in California. If you are a miscellaneous employee in most CalPERS agencies, you get Social Security. Uh, so it's a little bit different here. In fact, three of the four cities I looked at, there was no Social Security for miscellaneous employees. Safety, uh, 355, as Gretchen mentioned, there's a transition to 3 and, I'm sorry, 350 transition to 355. Both have a 12 month final salary determination. That's for existing employees. Again, that's going to change for new employees. Cities generally across the region pick up some of the contribution for employees. Employees typically contribute about 7 or 9%. And very often the city says, don't worry, we'll pick it up, we'll pay that for you. Cities are clearly moving to lower costs and lower, uh, lower tiers and lower costs. Um, mm -hmm. And then generally, retiree health benefits are awarded after five years. But again, that's also the news. There's a lot more detail in this in the report. I didn't want to spend a lot of time on this because they're relatively similar across the cities that we looked at here. So the funded ratio, this is in 2010 because that's the latest actuarial data that I have from CalPERS. Uh, across the four cities look like this. You say, wow, this is great. Fullerton's number one. We're almost 70%. Nothing to get excited about. Um, if you're at 70% and you're, you know, leading the parade here uh, and Costa Mesa is down here at 58, that's still out of the story. I mean, everyone's really in trouble. And there's not that much difference among these to really, to really get excited about. So if you take the current assumptions, the 7.5% assumption, all the other actuarial assumptions that are made, <laughs> Those are the numbers. So again, Fullerton's a little over 68% according to the data that I have. And then if you say, well, let's assume that going forward we only get 6% per year rate of return, or that's our discount rate or assumed investment rate of return. If that's the case, then Fullerton drops down to about 50. In fact, everyone's about 45 to 50%. So to be clear, what that means is you've got 50 cents in your pocket for a dollar that you owe. So it's a really horrible position. If you were in the private sector and you were below 60%, you would be faced with a, a huge number of restrictions in terms of what you could and could not do. Uh, some different set of rules, again, for the public sector, which in my opinion should change. If you then say, well, let's move to 5%, that 5%, then you really get some fairly low numbers. Fullerton's about 45%. Costa Mesa is the lowest at about 38%. So you see the impact of these different investment rates of return on the funded status for the different uh, cities that we looked at in our county. So I also said, well, what's the total unfunded liabilities? What do the cities really know? How much underwater are they, if you will? And in the case of uh, Anaheim, um, 600 and something million dollars. That's the difference between assets and liabilities for the city of Atlanta. Much bigger city, so maybe it's not so bad. We'll see in a second, it actually is. Um, so the numbers here are 200 to about uh, 250 for between Costa Mesa, excuse me, Fullerton, the lowest, to Newport Beach. Again, in terms of the absolute magnitude, the, the number is lower here. Again, nothing to get excited about. It's better than the other cities that we looked at, but it's still not a good number. 
if you change that investment return assumption to 6% again, then Anaheim goes up over a billion, about $1.2 billion underfunded, or unfunded, excuse me. Uh, Fullerton is about 350, Newport is over 400. And if you have the last one in that last scenario of 5%, Anaheim gets up to about one point, almost 1 1.6 billion, that's it, that would be their unfunded liability if you use that set of rules, that set of assumptions. Fullerton ends up at about 450. In fact, when you add in unfunded health care obligations, the number for Fullerton uh, in that last scenario uh, does get up to about uh, half a, uh, to about $500 million, uh, half a trillion dollars, a big number. So I also looked at per capita, because it's not, it's, it's better to look at the per capita unfunded liability, um, I think. And you can see here that the red is the 7.75% assumption. Again, that's been changed since then, so those would be adjusted slightly. Seven and three quarters percent for Fullerton, the unfunded liability per capita is about $1,200. So if you, you know, went around every person in the town, you would essentially today, and you wanted to pay off this unfunded liability, you would have to ask every single person for about 1200 bucks. That's assuming the current um, um, that's with the current assumptions that are being made. If you change that to again the five percent rate and the six percent rate, the number for Fullerton gets up over three thousand dollars. So if you maybe you want, might want to call it pessimistic, some would call it realistic about the future investment rates of return, the number for Fullerton um, gets up gets up to about three thousand dollars per capita, three thousand dollars per person in the city. What's interesting, I think, about this graphic. And uh, is that the, and I'll call it the worst case scenario for Fullerton, that 5% scenario, is about the same as the best case scenario for Newport Beach. So Newport Beach is in much worse shape on a, uh, an unfunded liability per capita basis than anyone else. They start off at 3,000 and they get up to that 5% that uh, scenario to about almost $7,000 per capita. Or this is just pensions, this is not retiree health care. Uh, the unfunded retiree health care is liability is smaller. If you focus on the bottom two columns, uh, rows, excuse me, the for um, uh, Anaheim, you see the unfunded liability for pensions is 1884. Just above that is 434. And it's roughly the same ratio through that. Now, these are arguably pretty optimistic. Um, scenarios for retiree health care. Most of these assumptions, most of these numbers assume that retiree health care costs and health care premiums generally start at about a, an inflate, a medical inflation rate of about 9%, and that medical inflation rate stair steps down to about 4% by the year 2019 or 2020. I can tell you that most people who are in the health care business, and I teach health care policy class, um, would argue that it might actually be flat or even up, especially with the federal reforms that are, that, are, that are, in my opinion, don't control cost enough. And so we'll probably see higher numbers. So instead of these numbers being three or four or five hundred dollars on a per capita basis, they might be seven or eight or nine hundred, something like that. That's that's one of the next big challenges I think for cities across California. Contribution rates. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have rates back to 1982, um, but I do have them from 1999, and you see what happened here. Safety is in the red. So this is Fullerton safety started off at about 11% in 99, dipped down to 0% for three years, shot up uh, because of market events and, and benefit increases back in the early 2000s. And then they came down a little bit, and now they've been climbing up fairly steadily uh, and, and to do so for the next several years. Miscellaneous, same sort of story. One of the, I think, lessons of this, and it was contained in the governor's uh, in the reform package, is that um, people shouldn't have contribution holidays. Even if you think you're in great shape, you should still contribute. Because over the long run, you're probably not going to get that 8% or 8.5%. You really need to assume something lower. And even if you've got money today, keep making it. You can make the adjustment. In the, you know, in the longer term, uh, 
uh, but you should never get a place where you contribute, you're contributing 0% towards pensions. This is the employer rate, of course. Lower investment rates of turnout, and one slide here, and it shows the effects on the contribution rates for the city of Fullerton under those different scenarios. So again, the red is the current, or actually it's the old, that's the seven and three quarters, that was current in 2010. What happens if you um, assume a seven and a half percent investment rate of return, a six percent, and a five percent? I'll start with the top one on safety. So today, the safety rate for the city is a little over 30%. Let's assume that you go to a 6% investment rate of return. That contribution rate goes from about, um, about uh, 30% to about 60%. It doubles. Now, why is that? Um, I, this quote is always attributed to Einstein. We don't know if he actually said it, but compound interest is the most powerful force in the universe. So you drop. You drop just from seven and a half to six, but your contributions that you have to make that rate actually double. So a small change in the investment rate of return assumption has this huge impact on your contributions that are required. Same sort of story for miscellaneous. In again, what I will go ahead and call the worst case scenario, uh, you end up miscellaneous goes up to about thirty, more than thirty-five percent. Safety goes up to 70 something percent. I did a project for the city of San Jose, and I had projected that in that last scenario that their contribution rate for safety would be at about 100 percent. So if you pay every, if you pay a dollar in salary, you're also paying a dollar in pension cost. That's pretty unsustainable. Not most of these are unsustainable. Uh, the higher contribution rates obviously translate to higher spending for the city as well. And the question is, what gets shoved out of the way? What sort of choices have been made by these five individuals over here? Um, if you look at the current situation, the bottom line investment rate of return again in 2010 was seven and three quarter percent. You're spending rough numbers about twelve million dollars a year on pension contributions. That's the city's contribution. If you go to seven five, it increases by a little less than one point eight million dollars. And then in the scenario that I like to think about is that 6% scenario, you actually go up by $12.3 million. So your contributions, the actual dollars you have to pay, go from around $12 million a year to around $24 million a year. And the question is, what else could you have bought with $12 million a year? It's a pretty significant impact. And again, that last scenario, 5%, you end up with almost $20 million in additional spending compared to what you're spending today. Moving forward starts with recognizing the magnitude of the problem. Um, this is kind of like an AA uh, meeting. I've never been to one. Uh, but people have to acknowledge that there's a problem. And, and I will tell you that I had a conversation with, a, with someone from Cal Sturs, not Cal Furs, about a year ago, and he said, we can test our way out of this. Well, just to make sure that, that, and I don't think that's the Calpers decision, certainly, just to make sure that people understand how uh, unlikely that is. Calpers would need to earn about 14% per year for the next 15 to 20 years just to have an 85% chance of meeting its obligations. There was a guy in New York named Bernie Madoff, and Bernie Madoff, Average ten and a half percent for seventeen years. So it's a pretty tough number, and, and uh, those weren't real. So it's a pretty tough Eileen, number. Eileen, call the main desk. Eileen, please call the main desk. So that's a pretty tough number to read. So again, you can't invest your way out. You've got to invest everything that's at your disposal. I think you have to use. And the council has to decide, you know, what they, you know, you have to decide what you want to do. You know, politically and otherwise. Feasible. I think that was reductions. And I think that the governor's plan that he signed this last week is a small step in the right direction. Uh, in my in some cases he actually makes things worse. There were some categories um, of employees who actually are going to get better benefits because of the bill last week. There's no one recorded on that that I've seen. But you have to reduce benefits. And again, I think you've got to find ways to attract good people, but you also can't provide benefits that aren't sustainable because no one's 
uh, no one who served in the long run um, in kind of that uh, scenario. I think it's really, really tough. I think it's impossible to fund a 30-year retirement or a 40-year retirement because people are living longer and their spouses are living longer based on 30 years of contributions. It's really tough. If you go to one of these online calculators, you have these uh, retirement calculators, try to get 70 or 80 or 90 percent of your final year salary after working and retiring at age 55 or age 60. And to do it using what I think are reasonable assumptions, you have to put away about 50 to 60 percent of your income every month. It's a big number. So that's one thing you have to do. There's got to be greater cost sharing, I think. And then I think. Uh, you'll have to at least entertain at some point new revenues. I'm not suggesting you should go out and get new revenues now because most people will probably say no. But on down the road, that, that may be something that, uh, that uh, folks here and elsewhere have to consider. Um, again, you've heard this, uh, uh, that the city has begun to reduce benefits, but most of those, uh, and I think Kerry agrees with this, that most of those are concentrated in the distant future. If you have about a 3% attrition rate, that's the number for CalPERS overall. It takes a long time to realize those savings. Um, the same thing with the 36 versus 12 month salary determination for new employees. I and mean, all those things are just they're, they're very slight movements in the right direction. If you go from a second tier, as the city has done, <coughs> for safety, to go from 3% at 50 to 3% at 55, there's the savings, but it only reduces the contribution rate by the city by about 4%. <coughs> so you go, in this case, from about 30 to about 26. Again, this, in my opinion, points out that the benefits levels, even at even 3 to 55, are probably too high. They're just not sustainable. Increased cost sharing will also reduce city pension expenditures, but only slightly. If, you, if the city and others could find a way to share all costs, if you could sit down with your units and bargain, and bargaining negotiations and say, look, you do 50, we'll do 50, then it would save somewhere between four and $13 million a year. So that's real money. Um, but that's not permitted. <laughs> because the law that was passed in Sacramento only allows you to share normal cost. The normal cost, as you heard, are the ongoing costs of funding that pension it doesn't deal with the unfunded liability, which is huge right now. And I estimated that for Fullerton, a 50-50 normal cost share for safety only would save about $630,000 a year from spending on $12 million. Uh, and that's about 7.4% of current city pension expenditures for safety employees. And I've done this work for some other cities out there. It's a pretty small number. So even that 50-50 share doesn't get you very far in particular. For Fullerton, it doesn't get you very far because your safety normal rates are so high and because you've got that 12% cap. So employees, that was one thing, one of the things that I think was unfortunate about the law, the new law, is it caps that safety employee contribution of 12%. Um, I should probably emphasize this last one a little bit more, but in the long run, if, even if you wanted to, let's say the city could unilaterally say, well, we're going to share costs 50 50, we're going to do all these other things to save the city money. Unless everyone else around here does the same thing, the other cities, you'll see, you'll see your employees leave. And you're not going to be able to recruit good people to come here either because it won't be competitive. And so you have to, I think, go very carefully and deliberately down that path. You have to go there. Um, but I think there's some danger uh, if, uh, if there's you know, too much that's shifted on the employees' uh, backs without a consideration of the overall compensation system, or the overall compensation for those employees. Um, new revenues, uh, again, I'm from Marin County where people vote for taxes a lot. I understand I'm in Orange County where people don't vote for taxes a lot, but I think that in the long run, it may be something that's, uh, that the city might uh, you know, need to consider as, a, you know, as one of these many options that are out there. Uh, I'm not, again, not suggesting that it's the first step, but maybe some step along the way. 
A couple of examples, a half cent sales tax raises seven million dollars. That closes half the shortfall in that mid case scenario. Uh, you could have a parcel tax of two hundred seventy dollars per year. They have a parcel tax in Oakland. It's several hundred dollars per year for an average home there. And people in Oakland literally are paying an extra X hundred dollars a year to pay for pensions um, because they probably manage things worse than we do. Um, but those are some of the things, just to give you a sense of the magnitude, I know that, uh, you know, uh, certainly your, your staff knows a lot better about uh, uh, potential revenues down, down the road, but um, it, in my opinion, it doesn't make a lot of sense to go down that path uh, unless you deal with some of these structural reforms I think is necessary. Uh, and I will um, close there and glad to be you. Mayor, if I could, before you go to questions, there is another slide, but I'm not going to go through to the problem to go back to it again, but there is one on next steps and options for the council. And uh, those options that we've identified, and I'm not going to say this is an all-inclusive list, but to schedule regular session discussions for um, considering the Bayes-in option that Mr. Worgen mentioned on the PERS change to the 7.5% discount rate, to consider the other PERS options mentioned by Mr. Uh, Worgen uh, for the pay ahead and the fresh start, and to consider um, the final report and options um, by Dr. Nation in an, a regular session agenda. Also, to complete the 2013 OPEB evaluation with our um, actuary who does that separate from this process, and schedule a presentation by that uh, consultant, and then consider funding options for our OPEB. We were not able to get our OPEB actuary here tonight, and I think we would probably wouldn't have had time to deal with that issue as well. So we're thinking probably in the future you'll want to take a separate look at that. And then um, begin preparing strategy for future negotiations. And thank you. Uh, I think with the time we're after five o'clock that we'd like to make sure that our public involved with this and, and have them come to, to uh, ask any questions they have. And, and uh, is it okay with the council members if they ask questions first? And, all right. Uh, if you are here from the public and would like to ask some questions either to our speakers or, or our staff here, so we'll make sure they're questions. How long has it been in existence? Uh, 1932. 1932? Okay. Uh, do you have an idea of, we had some data from uh, Dr. Nation regarding the achievement of uh, uh, investment returns over the last, uh, you know, 30, 10, and whatnot years. What has been CalPERS experience in investment return over the uh, longer terms, like, uh, 80 years. Okay, one thing I want to clarify is that the investments changed significantly uh, probably in the 80s. I think they shifted over to equities. They were probably like most uh, pension plans and uh, guaranteed product, bonds, things like that. So the returns prior to the 80s were probably 7, 8 percent maybe. Really? Mm -hmm. Because you got to remember the discount or the bond yields were decreasing, so you get a, a capital gain off the bond that side as well. So actually, you think that uh, CalPERS long-term investment results were seven eight percent? So your seven and a half percent discount rate that uh, Dr. Nation is speaking of as being uh, unsustainably high uh, is actually. Uh, 90-year experience. I bet you if you went long-term, I don't think you're going to be that far off, 7, 7.5%. Seven yeah, it was my understanding that, uh, you know, long-term uh, yields on any kind of professionally managed uh, portfolio were much more towards uh, 6% or lower uh, over historic numbers. Uh, you know, and I think it has to do with uh, rates of return on investments <coughs> uh, or business risk and uh, all kinds of market factors. I think uh, Dr. Nation's numbers are vastly more realistic. 
I can't imagine this uh, experience that you're uh, uh, alluding to as being correct. Okay. Public equity, long-term historical return, we're talking 1926 to 2009, is 9.86%. Thank you. Good, thank you. Thank you. Barry Levinson, I have a question for Joe Nation. Um, in the private sector, even though there's very few that find benefit plans anymore, but one of the options on, on many of the plans was a actuarial redu reduced um, benefit for early retirement. Are you aware, and, and, and for that reason, it, it basically is supposed to be a, a non-impact reduction in benefits you want to retire at 55 versus 65, they figure it out actuarially so that over the course of somebody's normal lifetime, about 85, up to you know, 80 years, 85 years of age, it should cost about the same. At least that's, that's, the, that's the concept. Is there any move at all in the public sector to consider that? Because I have not seen anything along those lines that somebody can retire earlier, but they take a much less benefit because they're still young enough to work at a different profession if they like, which many times they do anyway. Is there any movement anywhere in California or, or in other states throughout the country with that? Overall? Well, that, I mean, that's effectively what's happened with this, you know, I hesitate to call it reform because it does so little at Sacramento. It actually does effectively reduce or extend working periods. I mean, the, 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 the Full retirement age for miscellaneous employees for for new ones is 67 now, and so uh, the the effects are the are roughly the same. Um, the the question is whether you know whether that's still enough or whether there are other modifications that have to be made. Uh, but it's happening. The question, in my opinion, is whether it's happening quickly enough. Uh, I think, and you know, again, the the guy who runs Seeper where I'm housed you know, says, well, I've got an easy solution. Everyone works five more years. I mean, that's his solution. Public sector, private sector, everybody does. You know, that's that's what you have to do, um, and that's not that. Uh, you know, one could argue that's not that unreasonable given that longevity has increased by such a large amount the last few years. Could I jump in real quickly um, on on this issue of equity returns as well? If you if you look at the the data I have, uh, this is a previous question, show that from 1900 to 1999. Uh, the Dow returned 5.3% per year plus dividends. So, uh, you know, the Warren Buffett number, Warren Buffett says the number is about 6 to 6.5%. He says that's the long term number. And I think that's probably more realistic as well. Could either of you gentlemen also uh, comment on the impact of pushing the can, kicking the can down the road with these problems? How much more of a drastic adjustment will we have to make? don't take care of these problems currently and wait. For instance, in the city of Fullerton, they just went through negotiations last year, and all the different unions got three-year contracts. So my understanding is it goes through the end of 2014. So currently, we're in stuck with the current contracts for the next three years unless somebody wants to voluntarily adjust them. And therefore, what's the impact of having to wait about three years as opposed to I don't know what the number is for Fullerton. I, I estimated the number for the state. Every year the state delays a solution, what I call a solution. It's about a $1.3 billion debt that we're adding, about $1.3 billion a year. Uh, I mean, we're, you know, if, if you, you know, I always like to use the credit card analogy. You know, if you, if you have a credit card debt and you only pay a certain amount and you're paying less than the minimum, you know, you're not paying any on that principal, you're just sort of digging that hole deeper, and, and my best estimate for the state is about $1.3 billion a year for kicking the can down the road. One final question for, for, uh, for Carrie Warden. Um, I looked at both the miscellaneous and the safety charts, and in both those charts, you see that the percentage of the employer contribution goes up, considering the, uh, the, um, the estimates you gave. Does anybody in Hertz have a concern that the estimates are going up? 50, 60 percent over the next 10 years, or it looked like it was. Um, it started out at 8, it's going to 16. Is, is, is Perks concerned about that? That even if the current projections are correct, the cities are going to be on the hook for a lot more money? 
I mean, obviously, we do have a 30 year amortization period, and this is one of the things I recommend to the, to the city is that if you pay those down sooner, you're going to pay less over time. And as Joe says, you're not taking down the road as far, you're paying more than the minimum balance. And every city can do that. Again, it's just a funding policy that they have to follow. So there is the ability within the system to pay more and to reduce, obviously, a higher contribution rate, but it's going to reduce your. Uh, long-term cost of planning. One last question for consideration. Do you believe that if this problem is dealt with in this city, or for that matter, any other city currently, quickly, that it's possible to get on a good financial footing and keep the, uh, keep the uh, uh, fine benefit plan? Or do you see that as something that just is not sustainable? Uh, I, well, it depends what kind of defined benefit plans. Um, but uh, as I said at the beginning, I think it's a it's a very serious problem. It's the most serious financial challenge facing the California government right now, I believe. Uh, but I believe it's if it's manageable if the city acts aggressively on every front on which they can act. And without that, honestly, I, I think, and I'm not suggesting this is the path that Fullerton is on because it's much tougher, requires a lot more looking. Um, but there will be many more cities that look like Stockton. Uh, there will be many more cities that look like others that are on the verge of bankruptcy or will fight for bankruptcy. What's more likely to happen in the short term is that there will be what I, what Mayor Reed in San Jose calls service insolvency, where you have a city, but the city doesn't provide services. This library that we're in will disappear. The building may be here, but it won't open the doors because there won't be enough money to pay people to come here to work in the library. Um, all those things that people care about. Uh, the analysis I did for um, the, at San Jose, and the situation is not that much different here, showed that in five years, unless the problem is dealt with, in five years the city would not have funding to pay for anything except basic police and fire. No money for libraries, no money for potholes, no money for parks, no money for anything that cities want to do. So you might be able to, you know, avoid bankruptcy. You might be, but 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 the city will be a shell of what it, what it used to be, I think. And I think that's common across California. And then here, one last thing in your slide, that uh, I think you said that the uh, the new governor governor's new plan is caps employee um, contributions at twelve percent for safety. For safety. Yeah. Now I was looking at at, at, at Mr. Morgan's chart, and it showed that I think in two thousand nineteen. The city of Fullerton was up to city portion was up to about forty percent if everything goes smoothly. Mm -hmm. So what that tells me is even under the new plan, it would still mean that cities like ourselves would be facing about a twenty-eight to thirty percent uh, payment of basic of percentage of salaries going forward, which is a huge amount. Can I clarify something? I, I did a lot of the costing work on the new plan. Um, the new plan on the safety side costs about 21%. So if the employees are going to be paying 9, the employer costs about 12. On the miscellaneous side, the 262 plan costs about 12%. So depending on what the employees pay to that plan, we're still not sure what it's going to be. If they pay half, as he suggests, they're going to be paying 6. The employer's going to pay 6. That's on new employees, so that won't have, those numbers will take effect for the next 34 years down. Right. But those are the normal costs. Normal costs going forward of that plan. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Do we have anybody else in the public that would like to ask a question? All right. We'll see the council members that would like to ask questions to presenters. Thank you, Mr. Nation, for your uh, report. Uh, you talked about um, tax increases as one of the possible alternatives. And then you alluded to that could be difficult in the city of Fullerton. What if what if tax increases are flat out impossible? Are there other other ways where we could eventually have a chance to get out from under this this liability? Uh, I think I think you could probably get there, but the question is what what you want to trade off, or what whether you know how much you're willing to, to cut in terms of benefits and salaries and other costs that are out there. Um, I, it's certainly tougher. It's certainly tougher. It depends on on your approach. 
um, but it's um, uh, yeah, you know I had to look at the numbers more carefully to see if you could get there, what sort of cuts would be required and, and, and benefits, and what else you'd have to reduce. Um, but the, the numbers are pretty enormous, as you as you saw. Uh, and, and there may be and there may be a way to get there. I mean, there you know I was on a I was on a local board and and I remember and we you know managed to get our operating cost down about twenty percent. You know we didn't have to raise rates or do any of those things either. So there may be a way to get there, uh, but it's, it's 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 harder certainly. Is that something that you could look at and put in the final report? Sure. Okay. Sure. Yes, Dr. Nation, uh, very much appreciated the, the study and the report and those conclusions that you shared with us. I, uh, although the focus seems to be primarily on how do we pay for these enhanced costs, uh, we have uh, public employees which have been covered by retirement plans for decades, but only about a decade ago were these costs significantly increased, increased by uh, increasing the multiplier times the number of years served, and lowering the effective age of retirement. So what you're alluding to here a little bit is we need to attack on all fronts, but it seems like the, the majority of the report is focused on how do we pay for these increased costs, almost like the health care situation that you talked about. Uh, we need to find effective ways of cost control, of giving back, uh, other than launching new tiers, which takes a long to uh, so the, the likelihood of paying these increased costs as we're talking about, either with new revenue or the other alternative, the clear alternative which the private sector has taken, which is shifting the investment risk to the beneficiaries of pensions. And so that would be some form, a hybrid or combination of shifting from defined benefit to defined contribution plan. Uh, in your opinion, is that a more rapid way of, of correcting you know, the situation? Uh, I think one of the problems that, as you pointed out, that, that's occurred to date is that there's this asymmetric risk. The risk is borne by the taxpayers and the other programs in the budget. The, if, if, you are, if you are a defined beneficiary, if you have a defined benefit plan, for the most part, you, you know, people will say, I'm getting that benefit no matter what. Even if we get a negative 20% return for the next 10 years or using hyperbole there, I'm still going to get that number, I'm still going to get that benefit. And, and I think we, I think there needs to be governance reform of CalPERS, uh, and I'll try not to be too harsh here, but I think, Cal, I think CalPERS is a, is a fundamentally corrupt system. I think the governance structure is fundamentally corrupt, and it's because you have people on the board of administration of CalPERS who have have their their own personal interest is served by pushing off costs to the future, which means the next generation of workers and the taxpayers. There are studies that have been done that show that the higher the percentage of beneficiaries on a board of administration like CalPERS, the worse the returns as well. Um, and, you know, the worse the outcomes generally. So. Um, I think that's something that needs to be fixed. Unfortunately, the, gov I mean, the governor wanted that, and unfortunately there was none of that before. He says he's still going to work on that. You mentioned specifically a hybrid plan. I think that makes a lot of sense. And there's nothing wrong with a defined benefit plan if you fund it well, but, and they have realistic assumptions. That's not what's happened here. Um, I'm going to go up a little bit out of a limb here and tell you what I think would happen if, if you and others suggested a hybrid plan. The new, the new law, the reform law, says that that what you negotiate has to be approved by the legislature and the state's actuary, who is the CalPERS chief actuary, and they may reject it if it increases cost or risk. So, in theory, if you're moving to a hybrid plan, that's going to reduce your cost, right? So it seems that they wouldn't be able to reject it based on that. But I think what's likely to happen is they will say, or they may say, especially the legislature, they may say, well, this is too much of a risk for the employee, so we're going to reject it. So I don't know, honestly, if you could have a meaningful hybrid plan reform.
reform. I think you should, um, and hopefully someone will do that, and we'll see how far it gets in the legislature and Congress. Thank you. That was a very good uh, answer to it. And uh, the historic view of a fair negotiation is when, at the conclusion, you'd be willing to switch sides with the other party. Uh, so uh, the idea of shifting the investment risk, we're at a bit of a standoff right now because possible beneficiaries of retirement plans say that we're going to hit those investment return targets. And so to me, you have to be able to look at maybe flipping that and saying, if you're so certain of that, then it's time for you to assume those investment risks. And in effect, there would be no risk from your perspective. So that would be the shift all the way to a defined contribution plan. If, can I add one other quick comment? That is that if, I, I believe the number is still 3.8%. If you terminate from CalPERS, uh, if you were to leave the system, your liability is discounted 3.8%. That's because they don't want the risk. And that's because they're not confident they're going to get that 7.5%. And so if someone said to me, when it's, you know, when it's their money, there's a different perspective. And I think that points the, to the fallacy of using 7.5%, frankly. Thank you. Yes. Um, do we have any other council members grab the <laughs> Another question. Um, you kind of made it sound like, as far as solutions, it's either going to, change is going to either happen at the bargaining table or going back to the taxpayers. Is that it, or is there any third option? Or how does that, how, how would you? Oh, sorry. No. I think that you know if, if you have benefits that in my opinion are, are, are unsustainable, you have to modify them. You probably have to have a longer term climb out of that hole than you would want to have because because you're so deep in it right now. So let's let's say you wanted to you to, to dig out of the hole in five or ten years, it may take fifteen or twenty. So it's probably a long term solution as well. Um, I, you know, I, I, most people don't believe this, but I used to be a union representative as well when I first got out of college, and um, and I think that I think that I hope that, that you know public employee unions understand the risk that they're taking uh, with these recent court rulings in Stockton. Maybe defined benefits aren't so well protected, and it, I think it would just be a, a horrific situation if you ended up across California with people who are counting on on reasonable retirements uh, or whatever they, they thought they were going to get who find that they're not going to get them uh, because there was intrans intransigence at the bargaining table uh, or because there wasn't a you know, willingness to, to, to meet halfway. Um, and um, but as you described, there are really only a couple of ways to go. One is to reduce costs. Um, Obviously, if you have money left, you know, sitting around, you, you want to pay off that unfunded liability, as Kerry pointed out, faster than you than you would otherwise. That's pretty tough to do these days. Um, but but there really aren't any good options, unfortunately. I, I have a, a follow-up question to that same question, which is that you, it noted that you know we could all be very much like Stan uh, Stockton, uh, which you know I think is very. Uh, um, would be very traumatic for, for everybody here, as, as you see, you know, I would say that if all of us analyzed where we were in 10 years or five years and are counting on a certain retirement, and we all find we're in a situation where we don't have it, obviously that's alarming. But on the other hand, have you researched best practices type uh, or models out there, whether they be in California or out of California, where cities, in fact, have uh, kind of used a hybrid mar model or so forth, so you're not looking at the shell of a city and employees that are leaving or some type of regional models because, of course, uh, if we, uh, in some way, some people would say are the leaders in this, then do we have our fleeing employees? And then also uh, a, a city that does not have the quality, and obviously you're now having maybe two services, public safety, fire, and then you have these incredible uh, facilities that, that uh, cannot be used because we don't have the employees here. Are there models where you've seen people move quicker than a 20-year plan out, but are still moving forward? 
the, uh, the problem for Fullerton and every CalPERS member is that you're at the whim of what happens in Sacramento. And, and because the legislature demonstrated just last month that they're not serious, about, in my opinion, not serious about reform, there's not much that you can do. Uh, you can leave CalPERS, but you know, it's not an option. Um, there really isn't that much that you can do. The, mo the model that I would point to in California is San Jose. San Jose has probably done a better job than anyone. How did they do it? They're not a CalPERS member. They were able to, because they're a charter city with an independent system, they put a measure on the ballot, and that measure, um, and by the way, this is a, a Democratic town with a Democratic mayor, with a Democratic council. Uh, voters there passed their, their pension reform measure with a 70% vote. Uh, and so they, there was a lot more cost sharing there, the reductions in benefits, they've sort of done everything. The other thing that, that San Jose has done, which is really important, is that they have governance reform. They no longer have a board that is dominated by those beneficiaries and other political appointees. They actually have uh, a requirement this, that, that um, the majority of their board members of the ones who manage the funds for, this, for San Jose's two funds, they have two. The majority of them have to have technical or other relevant expertise. They have to have 12 years experience, a degree in economics or finance or an MBA or you know, something along those lines. Um, that doesn't happen elsewhere. CalPERS has, I think it's, I can't remember if it's 11 or 13 board members, you mentioned 13 board members. Not one single one is required to have a financial or technical background. Not one. Now, some of them might have a little bit of a background, but I think you need to have, to have professionals. And, and so I would look to San Jose as a model that would really get you in the right direction. Any other questions? Uh, we are not a charter city. Does that make any difference? Yeah. Yes, you're not a charter city, and therefore you are restricted by AB 340, which, which doesn't allow you to do much, doesn't, doesn't move the needle very much, doesn't really move you to a much better place, unfortunately. Uh, is there a listing of the investments that CalPERS has, some uh, annual report or something, we we'll see what the money is? It's not just stock market, I assume it's real estate and a lot of other things. Yeah, there's a capital for that every year. This shows the assets, distribution, the allocation, global equity, real estate. I mean, there's a whole range of assets, obviously, that are being invested. And I was wondering, at some point, if staff might give us some actual numbers based on our actual payrolls. Uh, we have fewer employees. I understand the uh, percentage of uh, benefit costs is going up, but we seem to have a shrinking number of employees, too. So maybe the result uh, is, is not higher, but maybe flat. I don't know. I'd like to see what that actually is. Uh, for example, one of the uh, notes in here, there's an assumption of a 3% attrition rate. Uh, maybe it's higher. Uh, if you project it out over some years, I, I assume it would be. I kind of like to know where we actually are as a city, and I do appreciate all the numbers, but, but how do we actually stack up in terms of our real numbers? Thank you. All right, thank you. I think that we are going to go ahead and close this study session. We do have a closed session at 5.45, but we certainly appreciate the, the very valued information, and I know that it's a good information for the public and for us as council members. So thank you so much, and thank you to the staff. And uh, we will be going into closed session at 5.45, and then we have our, our regular meeting at 6.30. Thank you.